So I'd start out on this note. My very first job in television was at WCAU in Philadelphia as a talent coordinator for a show called Betty Hughes and Friends. You were performing at the second fret. So the first oh, time I ever yes. met you was as part of the Simon Sisters at Channel 10 in Philadelphia in the late 60s. Oh, the second fret was happening. That was an interesting it time, was wasn't it? It was a great place. Oh, I really loved it. That was, that was one of my favorite. I have memories of that. I remember Theo Bikel coming to, to one of our shows and he fancied my sister. And he sat in the, in the front row and he just kept on watching her and watching and watching her and afterward he asked her out and they had a little, a tiny tete-a-tete, -tete, shall we say. With Theodore Bikel? Yeah. Well, the host of that show, Betty Hughes and Friends, introduced Theo B Theodore Bikel to the audience and says, today we have Mr. Ted Bickle. <laughs> it's one of, one of those things I that you I think I've heard that story. This is true. Yeah. Well, you know, seeing you last night at Joe's Pub was so wonderful and I think the first thing that I felt so emotional about before the song started hitting me was just seeing you there on stage performing with your son Ben next to you. How does that feel? Well, the first couple of times that I performed with Ben and Sally, it was raw. It was really like, oh my God, I'm performing with my children. And the, the emotion kind of swept me, you know, and, and it was very, very moving and they were you know, shy and insecure, and kept on looking at me for, for, for you know, comfort. Now, of course, the other way around, and and I. I uh, sense that. Well, Ben is just so much more secure on stage than I am. You know, having done it so much more, Ben is on the road all the time, doing doing you know the, the nasty work, which, which he loves. It's not the nasty. But I saw him say like a couple times. It's okay. Things are things are things yeah, are cool. Yeah. So at this stage, you still are dealing with the stage fright that's haunted you all your life. Is that what you? you I call think it? I'm probably the most difficult performer to get up onto a stage. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, for some reason, and I and and it's, you know, I've of course tried to figure out what it is with with uh, with every different type of therapeutic, you know, yeah. worker, psychiatrist cognitive, behavioral, Freudian, Jungian, everything. And it's, it's been a wonderful journey because I've learned, I've learned so much, but, but um, I, I think it has, I think it's got something to do with, um, with feeling caught in a spotlight as if I were an, yeah. in, in another life a deer and, and my, you know, my, uh, I was being caught in the headlights of a car. But, but it's also, because I don't like flying much either, so it's it's about claustrophobia too. There's a link too. there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. and but, so but people have related it to my birth because I was a breech birth in a placenta previa, and I couldn't breathe while I was being you know for that. So that was, it was a panicky kind of kind of a situation. And well, I want to talk about some of the lyrics in in this wonderful new. Do we call it an album? Do we call it a CD? Is it a record? But it's some of the lyrics. Grabs. The, of, of the title song, This Kind of Love. You're the melody I never had to write down. You're the fantasy I forgot to forget. You're the magician who sings the sun down your face in silhouette. Fantasy, I forgot to forget. The water I never dared to jump into. I've never known this kind of love. And that's a very profound statement, particularly at this stage of life, to be able to really mean that. Is it coming from something in your life right now? It, it, I would say it's, it is coming from something in my life right now, and it also draws on past experiences that were novel. At, at, at the time and were, and were very much, um, they were very new, the stages of the romantic excitement were at a very new stage and a very surprising stage. In, in this case, 
this kind of love is, a, is the first lyrics are, you were just a friend of a friend at the bar. Yes, it starts out in a very haunting, there's a very haunting beginning to the song. Yeah, I never saw you as my type at all, but I was stranded with no ride home, so we drove the beach road in your car. And then obviously the chemistry grows during the car ride, and, and, and the moon is no small part of it. And, and the sitting close and the looking at the profile and getting in the conversation. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And sometimes it happens so swiftly, especially if you're in Rio and you're, yeah. and you're driving on a beach road and then maybe the gasoline runs out. And, and I didn't go into that part, but you stop on the beach and there's music coming from, from a local you know, a local, another local bar, or a house, or, you know, and the wonderful way that you can drift into a sensual experience before, it, you know, it becomes love. And of course, this is a, this is, it's, it's a controversial subject. What is a controversial Well, the fact that you can have such a sexual spree without without its having, you know, developed over years and years and years into hey, love and that. we went through the 70s. We know that, we know we know that's possible. <laughs> Don't we? I guess we do. It, it's def it's definitely possible and and it's still possible at at our ages and of course. And um and you know, sometimes you know, most surprisingly so. I I I, I never I never expected it. Nicholson recently said in an art, uh, or interview for the AARP magazine that he would like to have, he thinks, he thinks, one last great love of his life. And when I heard you singing this song, I thought, maybe Carly is having this great love of her life right now. That made me feel the good for you. The thing about the loves of one's life is that you never know until it's over. With your saying that, I have to say this. With Jimmy Webb is involved in the, the, the arrangements of your album. And his song, MacArthur Park, when he says, and after all the loves of my life, after all the loves of my life, you'll still be the one and wondering why. What does that bring to mind for you? Well, I don't think that, I think that that song was only true up to the point that he wrote that song. You know, I mean, maybe there, there is a secret love that never got fulfilled, that was never, that never brought out the best in him, that he regrets things about. She was the girl that got away. It's in the, it's in that category of the girl that got away. That, yeah, that song. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but that's but that's a totally romantic illusion. The guy that got away, the girl that got away. You never know about the fights you might have gone into, or that, or the differences that you might have had, and the the sourness that the relationship might have, have, have you know, brought to bear on itself. But you believe in love, and when you when you sing, I, I believe in love. Right, when you sing, I know. Coming around again. Yeah, nothing stays the same. But if you're, if you're willing, willing to play, to play the, game, the game, it's coming around again. It's coming around again. I believe in love. You do, don't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I am a true, true romantic. I mean, it doesn't get any more romantic than me. Good. It's, it, and it has served you well. I mean, it's still serving you very well. The, the album, to get back to this kind of love, is a hugely romantic album. Now, I want to go to another lyric. How can you ever forget? And that song, the concept of someone you love forgetting you. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, if you feel so strongly, I mean, I've had these experiences before. I was so in love with, a, with an Englishman um, in the late 60s who um, I was madly in love with, and I thought he was the love of my life. And he wrote an autobiography. You know, some years later, he left me. And, and he wrote an, an autobiography maybe like 15 or 20 years later after I had become a star. I wasn't a star, or a star. I wasn't, I wasn't known at the time that I had a relationship with him. And so he used me in, in the book in the most desultory fashion. Hmm. And he said, the, uh, you know, 
quite unattractive things about me that just stung. And I thought, how could you possibly have forgotten that we were going to get married, mm -hmm. that we were in love, that we were, that we were completely besotted with each other, that we were turned on by each other's minds and intelligences and bodies and the whole thing, the whole nine yards. And, and, and he wrote this cruel thing about me. Mm. That's, that's not remembering or that's not giving, that's, that's not giving any respect to what was. Is that what that song is about in your mind, when you sing it? Um, that song was started by the, by the co-writer on that song, yes. David Saw, and so he wrote the first verse. So I already had those words you know, to work with. So I didn't start writing until the second verse and then the bridge and then the, the outro, but I completely got it from the, the, in, the intro you know, words. Uh, from that 60s experience. Well, no, no, no. For, no. Many, for many experiences. For many experiences. Yes, you know, but I, but I look, you know, as I mentioned, the Simon Sisters in the late 60s were successful, and then obviously the tremendous early success, you know, with your debut with the Troubadour and your first album, going, coming all through all these decades. Uh, beyond talent, Carly, what do you think there is about Carly Simon that has helped make you so successful? Beyond your gift. God, what a question. You know, there was a, a fantastic guy in the audience last night who was a friend of Ben's. Ben, ben had just met him recently, and he was just out there, an out there kind of guy, like an attitude dancer. Was this the... Yes, the, yes, 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 yes. His name is Jonathan, and he met me after I came off stage during the time that Ben and David sang their song. And he said, I realize what your gift is, it's honesty. Mm. There's nothing fake about you. And, and, and I thought, you know, that's, that's some, that's, that may be the very thing that makes it so scary for me to go on stage is I don't have a persona. I mean, so many actors and you know, singers hide behind a persona, like Madonna, like Bette Midler, like, I mean, you know, so many people wear, wear an attitude, wear, wear a different, you know, a different set of, I mean, they just become somebody else, mm -hmm. or they have turned to alcohol or drugs or whatever. That was that was more common back in the in the old days, but um, but to go on stage and not know what I'm going to say, not know where I'm going to flub up, and accept the fact that I am going to flub up, and that it's okay. That's important. And and just you know sort of just see whatever comes out because I'm not ashamed of whatever it is that's going to come out because it's all of the human experience, I guess, is a gift. And that's a good answer, the honesty. Let's talk about some of the other lyrics on, on, on the, this kind of love. People say a lot when they want the job. I love that riff. People say a lot when they want the job. People say a lot when they want the job. Lining up sideways around the block. Promising, promising never to quit. It it's a full-time job to be a hypocrite. Good song. <laughs> I love that Good song. song. Good song. I just found out that that's number two on, on the adult contemporary chart. It just like just broke. I mean, it just well, it's smart. It's got the. It has a rap rhythm. That's right, another one. I'd rather fall from grace completely. Than let you change my mind. Than let you change my mind. That's Ben's lyric. That's a wonderful lyric. Yeah, isn't it? What really? does that mean to you? I'd rather fall from grace completely than let you change my mind. Ah, oh, it means I'd rather I'd rather give up an awful lot of of my graceful nature, my loving spirit, than let you change my mind. She's a stubborn girl, this daughter of mine, and he wrote it about her. He wrote it about. Yeah, she Sally. wasn't. She was. She had just left her boyfriend, who was one of Ben's best friends, and they'd gone off to a Caribbean island, and and. This guy called Sally, and you know, Sally said, "No way," you know, some, you know, something like that. And this guy was just broken. And she has that, she has that real metallic, stubborn side. She can have it. She's also a mush. <laughs> it's a good combo too. Yeah. Right here's another lyric: "The only time I feel at home is in my dreams." Wonderful. 
Well, that was a song that I that I actually started about a year ago, and and it was like just I was sleeping more and more and more, and I was you know it was a sign of depression, or of a low grade depression, and I just never never wanted to get up in the morning, and I just wanted to get back into the dream that I had just left mm. because it was so comfortable, comfortable, and had so many possibilities, yeah. and and it and and I was still alive and well with that person who, who had now passed on or was now out mm -hmm. of my life. And, um, and, then, and then I would wake up and I would just see that it was daylight and I would feel so guilty about all the people who were downstairs at my house already doing things. And I was just like, no, 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 and I would pull the cover over my head. And I wrote this song that says, the only place I feel at home is in my dreams. The only, the only time I've, I feel at home is in my dreams. The only place I'm not alone is in my dreams. The only place I recognize is in my dreams. And, um, and that, was, that was how it is a lot of the time for me. Actually, Mark Twain, in the last 10 years of his life, slept more and more and more because he, his dream life was so much more forthgiving and more uh, comfortable because he'd lost his wife and his daughter and, and had these, you know, these miser miserable and lonely things happen to him that, you know, and I don't think it's a bad place to be. I remember when I was very, very little thinking, I had very vivid, vivid dreams, not nightmares, vivid dreams, thinking, which is real, the dreams or this? They, they were, like I was age four or five, wondering about that. Which is real? The dreams seem real, and this is real too. One well, other... there's a, I think that there's a parallel universe. Well, and that, I'm and running that, alongside you, I agree with you. And that a great deal of what yeah. we dream about is stuff that's happening in our parallel universe at any given time, which, which takes, which, you know, borrows from the present and the past and the future and the imagination. Mm. Now, I have one last lyric I want to talk about. They, this is a song about your children. They just want you to be there. That's right. They don't care if you brush your hair. They just care that you're there. They don't care if you stay upstairs. They just care that you're there. Now, when I heard you sing that on the CD, I thought of the arc between the, that and the long ago lyrics, their children hate them for the things they're not they hate themselves for what they are. What a distance has been traveled between those two lyrics. Oh, your children can hate you and still want you to be there. Good point. Very good point. So, and they go through periods of hating you and dissing you and moving away from you. And, you know, if, if, if the relationship is solid, and that's why this song is not an ultimate truth because there are parents and children that do you know separate and it's and and it can be a very very disastrous and awful awful thing and I think a, a true a true kind of calamity of the soul but um, in my case you know my children just just want me to be there at, at all costs even when I don't hear from them for months they're, you know, in some place, boy, they really want me to be there. And whenever there's a problem, it's me that they call, thank God. Mm. The, um, the song I mentioned before, that's, that's the way I've always heard it should be. It just, I've always wanted to say this to you. This is a song that's haunted me my entire life. There are songs that do that. If You Could Read My Mind is a song that has haunted me, the great Gordon Lightfoot song. Because when that song first came out, I was married. I had an early marriage. It was not working. So the, the, the lyrics, like, they... They, 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 they drown in love's debris. I could feel it happening. And so, literally, that is one of those, I can't hear it without going all the way back to 1970 and where my life was then, which leads me to the question, of, you must, over the decades, hear wonderful things from people about what you've given them with the many songs you've written. I do, and that's, and that's of course, such a, I mean, what a, I mean, just today I heard about a, uh, a woman who is in, is in a mental hospital for bipolar disorder and depression and that she, that she sings anticipation every day and she gets the other, the other uh, people who are patients there to come and sing it with her. And, and what, a, what, a, you know, what a gift that song has been to some people for some reasons and, 
and, and the way I sang that song last night is a totally different way that I've ever uh, performed it. And I realized that the lyrics of anticipation for me right now are, are in These Are the Good Old Days. Not in the way that I used to sing it, which was very, up, you know, like crowning. These are the good old days, like hitting you in the face with it. Now I sing it like so against the chord. It's melodically against the chord. These are the good old days. These are the good old days. And it's just got, it just reeks of a, a thing that I never knew before mm. when I wrote it. You know. Well, that's the, the continuation of the creative process in your own work is, is a wonderful thing. I would not know this story if I had not just finished reading uh, Girls Like Us. The, the, let me ask you this. To quickly tell the story of how you wrote Anticipation. I think that's so interesting that you were sitting there waiting for Cat Stevens for a date. I had no idea that's where that came from. Yeah, I was, I had, I'd, I'd sort of, you know, fallen in thrall with him. Um, when I opened for him at uh, the Troubadour in Los Angeles, which was why I started performing. I wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for him. I was so crazy about him that I couldn't pass up the opportunity to open the show for him. There's also another interesting story about that, but basically that's where I was and, and I met him and spent, spent a week opening for him and becoming, I mean, I loved his, his music so much and sort of copied his music and copied his style. And then we got to New York, and, and I was going to open for him at uh, Carnegie Hall. And, and he called me up and, and uh, asked me for a date. And I said, well, would you like to come over here for dinner? And he said, sure, that sounds great. And so I made him um, you know, a dinner, but I was waiting for him to come over. And he was late. He was really late. And so I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I sat on my bed. For some reason, I was looking in the mirror because my closet door faced the bed and I was just kind of sitting there and and I wrote the song in about 15 or 20 minutes before you know before he came just realizing that I couldn't I couldn't stay in this kind of panic state you know and I said we can never know about the days to come but we think about them anyway and you know um, I wonder if I'm with you now or just chase or just chasing after some finer day so I really didn't know what I was doing with him, but I knew that the tension had to come out somewhere. And the excitement and the tension of expecting Cat Stevens to ring my doorbell was enough to bring that song forth. Do you ever get a postcard from him or anything these days? What's happened to this guy? Unbelievably, I got a call on my birthday from him two years ago. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't know it was my birthday, although we're both Cancerians, so, so I remembered that that his birthday was like July 6th or something, and mine is June 25th. And on June 25th, I got a call, and it said, hello, Carly, this is Yusef Islam. And I said, oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know anybody named Yusef Islam, and I hung up. Ah. And then he called back, and, and the same thing happened. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I don't know you. And I hung up again, and then he called me later on in the day, and he said, and he relinquished his, his old name. Mm. And he said, Carly, this, this is Cat Stevens, or, oh. or, or Steve, which, which is what his real name is, Steve Dimitri Giorgio, that was his first name. And, and he said, remember I used to play with you back, oh. in, back in the 70s? And I said, my God, it's you! Oh my God, it's you, of course it's you! I love you. I loved you then. I love you now, and I'll always love you. Mm. And we just got into this great conversation, and he told me how he'd gotten back into songwriting because he bought his son a guitar, this little guitar, and he picked it up again and began playing and writing songs again. And he was working on his new album, which, which is quite wonderful. It uh, came out about, about a year and a half ago. And, and, uh, and how he was doing all this great work with children in the north of England, and you know how he had set up a whole settlement for 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 underprivileged children, and and um, just told me the work that he was doing, and, and and I said, did you know it was my birthday? And he said, no, I didn't. And we talked about how he had he had just been dislodged from the plane that he 
was, yeah. you know, had been flown into Maine and he wasn't allowed in the country and uh, he was deported. And he said, why, why do people feel like that, that I'm a bad person there? Mm. You know, and we talked about it and I, I you know, I remembered the Salman Rushdie whole thing and Ayatollah stuff and, but I couldn't remember the specifics of that. All I could remember is Cat Stevens and my love for him and my love for his music and, and that he is a good soul. I just know that, and I've always known it. It also proves you have the same phone number for many years, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'd gotten my telephone number from, from somebody in Los uh, Angeles. Now, the book, Girls Like Us, triple biography of you, uh, Carol King, Joni Mitchell, and the premise being that you, your lives, the way you live your lives, and your music help redefine a generation of women. What do you think about that? Pretty impressive. I mean, pretty... Agreed. Very... Very flattering, very flattering to be with those two in incredible women who, who I learned so much from. Just in listening to their records, I would go into, you know, I would go and buy their records and listen to them and think, you know, I've got to play like Joni. I've got to it's, see what if I did that chord and then what if I, what if, you know, Carol plays so naturally. She just you know, plays such natural songs that have such natural changes. And so I tried all of these, you know, because. When you first get your own voice, you, you take on the voices of a lot of other people that you admire. Odetta was the first great, great folk singer. The first great singer who I just, I tried to sound like, I tried to sing like, I tried to play the dreadnought guitar like. I, but then, you know, Joni and Carol and Joan Baez, Judy Collins, you know, so many other women were were starting to flourish in these record bins. There weren't many women, you know, who were writing songs then. And I always looked for, for those that did and, and, and very, you know, very much studied the Ladies of the Canyon and, and Carol, Carol's Tapestry album. And, and, um, and it's because of them, really, that I, that, I, that I thought that maybe I could be a songwriter, too. Did I, you? Th I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't want to be. A, I didn't want to be a performer, but I did want to be, be a, a writer. Yeah. Did you have a sense, Carly, that as the book contend that you were really setting an example and re essentially redefining the way women can live their lives, partly by what you were doing, the way you were living your life, and the things you were saying to women? Or were you just did I, doing did it? Did I think I could? No, I, I didn't think about it like that at all. Yeah. You know, things, things, things are are um, are in uh, retrospect seem to be, you know, at this, at this place in time, this is, this is the attitude of this one woman. I don't know how many other people agree with her or agree that this would be the, the uh, trio that would be recognized as doing such things or whether, you know, I feel pretty humble about being included with them. Um, I don't think either of them feel humble about <laughs> being included with me. But that's just a guess. That's just because I was, you know, well, I was the new kid on the block. Well, I, thought, I, thought it was an, I thought it was an equal trilogy myself. Um, there's a story in the book. In fact, I just read it last night. I closed, I closed the book last night about you and James Taylor that actually brought a lump to my throat when I read it. And I don't know if you read the book or not, but the, the story is I've, when you were undergoing, parts. You were undergoing ch chemo and you hadn't had a lot of contact with your ex-husband over the years, but he called you, or he came to see you, and you said to him, you know, if you ever thinking of me, just call me on the phone, even if you don't say anything. And he's, he said, Carly, if I called you every time I thought of you, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. And I thought, oh, to feel that close to someone still, and yet to be so far away. What does that bring to mind? To well, he has this he has this incredibly romantic side where where I'm sure I mean once he said to me at the end of a telephone call that was was basically about a school meeting that he couldn't attend because because he really tried to keep our lives separate and has always yeah. tried you know ever since we split and at the very end of the call he said goodbye old house mm. yeah James can say things that just really strike strike a chord and and when when I had cancer he said just make sure that they take anything out that could possibly hurt you just an eyelash and mm. like 
a fingernail, anything, just make sure that they get everything out. Oh. Wow, that's, that's intense. It, it's very, very this, intense. But this is all separated by years of not being able to talk to me, of refusing to talk to me. How do you, does one draw upon the strength of this? Well, let's see if I can actually quote this. Splendor in the grass, Wordsworth, what though the radiance which once shone so bright be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, beauty in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what we have left behind. How have you drawn from, what kind of strength have you drawn from that long ago period, that nine-year marriage? It must be some advice or something you could say about it that would help somebody who's just broken up. I don't think, you know what, I don't feel bad about the marriage in any way. It's James that feels bad because he feels that, I think he feels that he wasn't the proper husband, that, that he wasn't a good husband to me. And, and that because of his use of drugs and because of his going on the road so much and leaving the children behind, I think he feels regret. Mm. And so it's the regret accompanied by the threat that his, that his current wives feel mm. about his mm. past life that keep the separation, you know, it, to keep the Cold Wall War, to keep the, the Cold War, to keep the, the Berlin Wall up. Mm. And it's, and it's um, you know, whenever I do dream of him, which is so often, we're in this wonderful state together. It's never unhappy. It's always the best part of what we were. It's always those moments where he says those incredible things that you never forget. Mm. And, and it's just, I feel as if we are on the same, on the same radio wavelength, on the same, what, you know, that we're, that we're never really, that we're never really separated. And, and I think he doesn't, I think he thinks the opposite. I think he's mm. really, I think he's really been able to separate from me. I don't know whether he can separate from me in dreams. That's the only, that's, that's the well, only I possibility. What I feel is, and we can move on to something else, but what I feel is that you're, you are drawing strength from it. That's it's a very positive thing, I think. Oh, I definitely do. Yeah. I do draw strength from it, and I don't shy away from it. You know, I don't shy away from talking about yeah. it. Just because he won't talk about it or because he says that he refuses to talk about me, and there was, when he does his show, he has a slideshow of everything in his life except me. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like a, a sign. I mean, that you know, shows more than anything else that, that the guy has like a major, major problem with it. Mm. Well, let's get back to, and to kind of close here by, by looking at the CD, the, the, this kind of love. Um, there, is, there are great, great albums. You know albums. what, can I, can yeah. I just... Go ahead. Can I restate that? Because sure. I don't want to say the guy has a major problem with it. I, I don't think that that's kind, that, that just seemed crude to me. So, so, I mean, I would just rather say that, that, that his silence speaks, speaks very, very loud. I got it. Oh, but there's one other story I want you to, to tell, if you will, and then we'll, we'll conclude by talking about the CD. And that is a, such a terrific story in the book about Jacqueline Onassis, who became your friend uh, in, in the last few years of her life, playing a great joke on you, having to do with the, the opera, the, the tenor. Placida Domingo. Yeah, tell that story. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, she, she and I were, you know, really, really good friends. And I was doing a, um, a recording session, a duo, with Placido Domingo on a song called The Last Night of the World, which is uh, from Miss Saigon. And I had never, m I may have met Placido Domingo once before, but in any way, it was, a, it was an Ahmed Erdogan huge production in this sound stage in Queens. And I met him out there and, and I had told Jackie and also Mike Nichols who wanted to come too. I had invited them both to the, to the recording. And the recording was, was really, really funny. There were lots of amazing things, you know, like Placido couldn't swing and I couldn't sing. 
And, and it was, you know, Placido was saying, you know, if you hold your breath just a little bit in and then let it out. And I would say, but you got to swing in there. Last night, you know, so there were the little things that we were teaching each other. It was a really fun, fun session. I wish it was on, on film yeah. somewhere. And the next day I got, I got a package in the mail which contained a, a signed picture of uh, Placido Domingo. Mia Carita Carlita. Um, uh, we had the best time last night, love Placido, and also a copy of one of his one of his cassettes, the Venezuela, the the uh, wonderful Span Spanish songs, and I, and I can't mm -hmm. remember the exact name of it, which also had an incredibly romantic message on it, and I was just thrilled, you know. I mean, I just thought this is just such a compliment. He actually had a good time. He was, you know. Swinging by the end of the evening, he, 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 you know, it was great. And the first person I thought to call was Jackie to tell her. And so I called her and I said, you can't believe I got this package in the mail this morning from Placido Domingo saying, saying, Mia Carita Carlita. And it was so exciting. He really, really liked working with me. And she said, Carly, did you really think it was Placido. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful practical joke. And of course then I looked again and it was her handwriting, which you, of course you can't mistake. That's funny. Well, I want to conclude by asking you this question about the, the new CD with 13 songs, this kind of love. But all the span of the albums and the work over the years, what do you want this to be for your fans, for those people who want a Carl, new material from Carly Simon, what do you want this to be for them? They're thirsty for something, you're giving it to them? It's a return to the very, you know, so, sometimes private, always personal, and hopefully universal thoughts of a woman with my experience, of my age, without any apology, going through life, and living the experiences and all the vicissitudes of, of an incredibly rich experience of love and love and, and open-heartedness and gardening and politics and, and getting my godson out of jail and, <laughs> you know, all the things that I'm going through, plus, you know, in this case, a return to a strong rhythmic groove. I missed rhythm in my last four albums. I did two wonderful albums for uh, Disney, which were Winnie the Pooh albums, one a Piglet album and one, one a Heffalump album, which I loved doing, really loved doing. And um, they were both theatrical releases. They were both really fun movies to do. And then I did an album called Moonlight Serenade, which was... Standards. Standards, I, which I did with Richard Perry, which I loved. And then the last album before this was called Into White, which was very, very yeah. ch children-oriented, mother, children falling asleep, beautiful, you know, serene album. I missed, I missed the earthiness. I missed the drive that a drum and percussion can give you. So I was particularly interested in the, per in the percussionists and the drummers. Well, I think you have a wonderful hit on your hands. I've, I've listened to it seven times. I have songs playing in my head. In him, I've fallen to sleep with some of the melodies in my mind. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you for sitting and talking with us. It's a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.